We started last week, we've been talking about worship, and uh, last week we began talking about the criticism of worship. And uh, criticism can work in a few ways. Criticism can work that we can be critical of someone's worship. But criticism can also work that maybe someone has been critical of our worship. And so it kind of hinders us in worship. Um, you know, I've seen folks before that, you know, maybe they've talked about the way someone um, raises their hand or dances or shouts or however. And, and maybe they mean it and not to be hurtful, but that's really a sacred thing, really, not to be bringing up something that would hinder someone from worship. Because worship, we've already talked about, is important to God. So, uh, we talked last week a little bit about uh, ways that people worship. They cry, so maybe are quiet, maybe some kneel, maybe some stand, maybe some run, some, some jump, some... Uh, uh, whistle. We're not just talking about worship at church. We're not talking about worship in general. Now, probably we're thinking about worship when we're collective and if we're critical or judge someone. Uh, but uh, we talked also last week that this means of worship uh, could be due to our personalities. We're all made different. And uh, you know, we're all probably trying to sharpen our personalities or make it better who God's made us to be. Uh, but our personality is going to drive us to how we worship. Maybe the culture of how we were raised will drive us in our worship mode. Um, our emotions. Some are uh, display emotions differently. Or we talked about maybe even our emotional experience where we are now. Think if you're going through a really rough time. It may be that moment in worship where you're just broken before God, where you just weep and cry because it's just the, the circumstances in your life at the present time. Or maybe you've just seen God do amazing things to in worship. You can't help but to clap your hands or jump or be excited. Some of that can all be circumstantial too. So, you know, there are a lot of different uh, uh, reasons why we will worship the way that we worship. And we may not worship the same way every time. That's okay. Um, uh, everything is, is different. You know, some raise their hand, maybe lower or high. I don't care the way you raise your hand. It's a surrender to God. Um, you know, I've heard some folks say some things, but really, uh, as, as I uh, would think that I become wiser than the things of God, we just want folks to worship. That's just a wild mind because we were wired and designed to worship and we should be doing that. And so we talk about why do we criticize someone else for choosing an act of worship that is different than ours. Uh, that was our last statement. So let me read, uh, jumping down uh, on the page. Some quote unquote Christians are so critical critical of others. They criticize the way others sing, sing, the way they shout, getting excited, moving all over the place, the way they dance, D-A-N-C-E, and the way they worship, the way they live, and on and on, they criticize. Have you ever met someone with a critical spirit? That because someone doesn't do it their way, it's wrong. I found that there's a lot of ways to do something. I don't want to get ahead of myself. We tend to criticize anything that isn't done, quote unquote, our way. We justify our criticism by saying, aren't we supposed to judge people by their fruits? 
How many people here heard that say, aren't we supposed to judge people by the fruits? It seems the scripture has been misconstrued here. Judge not. Someone read it. It's going to be saying Matthew 7, 1, 2. Right, right. Judge not that you be not judged. Do you know what that way it says? For what for with what judgment ye judge, judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Let's read the next couple sentences and I want to say something. We're commanded to not to not judge. Then in the same chapter, uh, we are commanded to, to not judge. Then in the same uh, chapter in verse 16 and 20, it says we will know, no, K-N-O-W, we will know by their fruits. Judge by their fruits. I like this next verse, this next sentence. Instead of knowing by a harvested fruit, we judge the way they plow, the way they plow, the way they plant, and till. Let me just stop here for a moment. We judge by the way they plow, they plant, and they till. I've been doing a little bit of a um, research project. Now, I, I get to run into folks that are retired and folks that like to to, to, to plant gardens and and so uh, uh, I I, uh, I want to put a couple plants in this year see if I can uh, feel like I've, I've, I've made a difference in producing something so I've been asking folks uh, so what's your recommendation of when you should plant things so uh, my one recommendation was for the Craig that you should plant your tomato plants on Mother's Day they'll be safe if you plant on Mother's Day so then I had someone else tell me you can plant on Mother's Day, but you need to have like a barrier over top of them that, that they'll get heat because tomato plants like heat. Then I had someone else tell me, no, you don't ever plant a tomato plant before the 30th of May. <laughs> so there's lots of different ideas of when you should plant. Probably some in between there. But you know what the real answer is going to be for when you should plant your tomato plants? What's your real answer? When you have time, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> what is it? When you want to. When you want to. But what would the very end result be? When well, you don't want to stay in the too late, so you kind of feel time to go. Okay, so what would the end result be? Really, why are we planting those tomato plants? Because you want to get tomatoes. So I'm not going to worry about if it's Mother's Day or somewhere in between or Memorial Day. Let's see who has the most tomatoes at the end of harvest. Right? What do you think about that? Sure. Sure. I'm like Sister Beth when you get time, right? Maybe you won't have time. Maybe I should start planning on Mother's Day. <laughs> and I'll have a bit by the 30th. <laughs> but it comes to the same thing with our worship. And I'm trying to bring some humor. But you know, sometimes we can be critical of others, maybe of the way they worship. As a pastor, as long as everything's done in decency and order, and it's not contrary to the Word of God, and someone's not living an unholy life and trying to just show and worship, I want people to worship. That's the bottom line. I don't care how, how, how you lift your voice. I don't care how, how you lift your hands. I don't care if you're quiet or you're demonstrative. The most important thing is that we worship. Now, I do believe, once again, that the Holy Ghost is a powerful force. It'd be like going over and sticking your finger in the outlet. I'll guarantee you I'd be doing a little bit of a jig if I got some voltage from the outlet, right? So I do think that we probably will want to move and get excited when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. But everybody responds differently. 
And the greatest thing is to worship. And in the end, let's see what the fruit is. Sometimes I've seen people that are the loudest. They're loud and they're powerful and they're bang and they're boom and they're on fire, but they fizzle out the quickest. And sometimes it's just those people who are steady, 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 that you see that. And that's not always the case. I'm just saying. It is, it is not our job to criticize. That's our job to encourage worship. And you know, don't let anyone's criticism of your worship hinder you from worshiping. I've seen people that are very demonstrative. I'm okay with that. That doesn't scare me. And I've also seen people that are very quiet. It's okay. They're worshiping. I've seen people that worship a little bit different than me. You go down south and southern people worship different. We are in the north and it's a I'm, there, there's, there's, this isn't being derogatory either way, but there's a difference between the north and the south and the way they worship. Because it's culture. We are cultured a little bit differently. But the thing that we need to make sure we're doing is worshiping. Amen? That we worship. So I want to read John 7, verse 24. Amen. Don't judge according to the appearance. Just because they don't worship like us. Just because it's not... Let me just tell you, if we brought some people of color in here, I love them. I love them. They worship. They worship differently. And I appreciate that. You know, I, I, I do. I appreciate it. It's different. Uh, any of you ever see... Uh, 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 people of color and, and uh, they're in their worship service and the pastor is preaching and that person in the organ, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's worship. It's worship. And so um, I appreciate the worship that they're given. Um, people from different countries. I, I remember when I was a teenager, we had an evangelist by and uh, he preached. And when he preached, it was just his custom. He took his shoes off to preach. That's okay. It was his act of worship. It wasn't something for show. It was who he was and what he did. Uh, you know, I've seen ladies wave handkerchiefs in the air. I've seen people shout around, spin in a circle like a top. I've seen them run the backs of the pews. Just worship. It's okay. We're not there for a show. Um, we're there to worship God. Someone might say, well, I think she is in the flesh when she dances because her eyes are open. Does the, does the Bible demand us to close our eyes when we worship God and dance? Furthermore, can we possibly be in the Spirit, in the Spirit, can we be in the Spirit with our fault-finding and criticizing attitude? Amen. I just want to worship I want to see people worship. A young lady was criticized for slipping out of her shoes to dance before the Lord. What about Moses? God told him to take off, take off his shoes. That's right, really like. Any of you have ever been in a service you just felt like taking your shoes off or maybe you did it? I want to tell you, if you feel like, um, if you feel like taking your shoes off in service because you're standing on holy ground, take your shoes off. Who cares what anyone says? If that's your act of worship to God, then worship. Amen. Sunday night was just a very holy moment when the Spirit of God spoke. It was holy. I have to tell you, I felt like Moses on Sunday night. I just felt like we were on holy ground. If there ever comes a time that I feel like taking my shoes off and I'm worship, I'm going to do it. Don't criticize me. And likewise, I'll never criticize you if you take your shoes off. Worship. 
worship as if you're an audience of one, as if God simply has his eyes alone upon me. I believe that's really where we enter into worship. When, you know, Moses, he was an audience of one, but David danced like he was an audience of one. So our worship should be between us and God, not anybody else. I'm not to, to embarrass, but you know what, Sister God, I love when your husband said, so what, the one night he said, I, he just felt compelled to come and kiss the cross. It wasn't the emblem, it wasn't the cross, it's the emblem of what Christ has done for us. I'm not going to stop someone from their act of worship and what they feel nudged in their heart to do. Amen. We want folks to worship God and never criticize. What about David? He took off some of his clothes. And what happened to the one who criticized him? So we know here was King David. He was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. It wasn't the first time he attempted to do it. He was bringing it back to, to Jerusalem, to its rightful place. It was very important to him. He loved God. He wanted that place of worship. He longed to build a, a, a housing for that. We know that through Scripture that he was not able to do that. He was able to get a lot of things alive. That his son was able to do that. But he loved the presence of God. And as the Ark of the Covenant was coming, we know what he did. As he took off his kingly robes, there he is in his ephod or in the undergarment to that robe. Was it that he was, and what we may think of an undergarment today, he was clothed, he was, he was still a modest man, but he took it off and he danced before God. You know what happened as he danced before God? Someone tell me, I know that you know. She sure did. What was her name? It's okay, I'm not point picking on you a little bit. That's right. Michael. Yeah, and so Michael, his wife, and I know that our day we think Michael was a, a, a male name, but it was a female name, and so she despised because what she thought he looked foolish, didn't she? She was embarrassed. Was it because she was embarrassed of him because that was her husband? Was she embarrassed because she would not do this, so why should he do that? Yeah, if you say that, so she was, she, that wouldn't be what she would have done. No, Thank you. You, you, you. you brought me to where I wanted to get to, so thank you. What was what was her her end result? She had people to have children. You know, there was a price that was paid for criticism of someone's worship. Now, I'm not talking about nonsense. I'm talking about when someone is worshiping God. I don't ever want to hinder someone from worship. You know, I don't like to close a service if someone's still worshiping. There's sometimes that, that I will tell folks to quietly leave, but I don't ever close out on anybody. People can worship as long as they want to worship. And however they want to worship. I want them to, if it's from a biblical model, I want them to worship God. And just because it may not be our way of worshiping doesn't mean that we should criticize someone. Let people worship the way that they feel like they need to worship before God. Let me just say, I personally don't need someone coming in here with, with a flag routine and dancing and worshiping God. I think praise is spontaneous. I believe that, that, that it's thought out, but I think that it is with our vessels that we worship God. Amen. So uh, I'm not going to orchestrate a certain way to, to, to worship, uh, but we're going to worship together. Amen. Allow uh, folks to worship. Let's read on. There are Christians, or quote unquote Christians, that every time a name is brought up, they can tell you nothing but dirt about them. They bring up things that happened 20, 30, or more years ago. What if that person has repented and God has forgiven them? 
What business do we have as people who carry Christ's name have fault find, uh, finding fault, have finding fault, as I said that backwards, finding fault, F-I-N-D-I-N-G, F-A-U-L-T, and gossiping, G-O-S-S-I-P-I-N-G. Let's just say this. You know, I, I, I don't think that we're at that place in our church. I, I, I know that we have love for one another. And if you're like me, I can't remember yesterday. I told her, like I said on Sunday morning, Heather, I asked her a question. She said, I'm sorry, I have a problem with my, my short-term memory. And uh, her, her caregiver, if you weren't here, I know her caregiver, and she told me her caregiver's name. And by the time I got up to the pulpit to say I was glad she was in church, my short-term memory gave up on me, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know that too, brother. Glad I'm not in the boat alone. But but you know, sometimes when people are really striving to worship God, and I'm not talking about um, necessarily the way they may shout or they may raise their hand or worship, but simply because their life is trying to worship God. You know, are you the same person you were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that plus ago? I know I'm not. My perspective's changed a lot, and who I am has changed a lot. And I pray it continues to change, to be more like Christ. There's a lot of things that's under the blood of my life. I've got a lot of things that's under the blood of your life. And so we need to allow people that if they've asked God to forgive them, then it's underneath the blood. God doesn't hold that against them. So why should we? And what benefit would it be for us to bring up some sin or fault of someone who is made right with God from years ago when they're striving to live for God? And what benefit is that to the kingdom of God? I love when people find the grace of God, don't you? I love when they find a place of repentance and forgiveness and they make it there. And then we all grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ in the world. We don't want to be fault finders. We don't want to be gossipers. We want to allow people to put it beneath the blood. So I want to read Revelation 12, verse number 10. For the accuser of the brethren has cast down, which accused them before our God. So who's the accuser of the brethren? The devil. Has he ever accused you? Has he ever made you feel bad in your mind? Has he ever brought up past mistakes? Has he ever brought up past sins? Has he ever tried to make you feel unworthy? He's an accuser of the brother. But he also likes to get in and stir up a pot on people. He gets it all stirred up. But you know there's coming a day when in heaven... Praise God. The accuser of the brethren is going to be cast down. Daniel, he's not going to ever bring up anything from your or my past. Sister Doc, he's not going to be able to stir up the pot with someone else for them to bring up anything from our past. He's going to be cast down because Christ has forgiven us and we are redeemed. Jesus has to be through his blood. He cast our sins in the sea of forgetfulness, every imperfection about us. Someone uh, some time ago said something to me, and I thought this was pretty good. See what, see what you think about this. Someone shared with me that in their life, and I was listening to them as they shared, and you don't, you don't know them, I'm not telling their story, I'm not bringing any confidence, but they shared with me that uh, some years ago in their life, uh, they were in a relationship where, where someone fault found in them. And it was this constant, this fault finding. And they were in a close relationship with this person. And, and it was terrible because they were hard on themselves because of the fault finding. And so uh, 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 they said to me, and I struggle with this. I look at these imperfections that was brought up to me. And I find them in myself. And uh, they said to me, one day I realized that I was allowed myself to be bullied by that person. That really is bullying, isn't it? We can even have bullying in church. But they said the real problem was, was when I got rid of that toxicness of them in my life, 
that I no longer allowed them to bully me, but now I bully myself over it. Sometimes we can allow the enemy to bully us to where we bully ourselves over things that he bullies us over. He is beneath the blood. And every accusation that he gives us is beneath the blood. And so uh, it's great to know tonight that, that, that he is an accuser of the brethren, that Christ has set us free. And if we're, if we're, now let, me, let me backtrack and say a little bit. Now if you've repented of your sin, you've turned from your sin. Now, if you're still living in your sin, you've not really had true repentance, but you crucify him over again on the cross is what the word of God says. So we, 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 we turn from our sin. And so uh, uh, the Bible uh, uh, tells us that the accuser of the brother that's cast down, which, uh, 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 which accused them before our God day and night, he is the accuser of the brother. The next sentence says, one of the ways the devil accuses us is to get us to accuse each other. Each other. When we criticize, we become one of Satan's, Satan's little imps. Now, my desire, and I know your desire, is to be a tool for God. But if we're not careful, we can allow the enemy in our life. What did Jesus say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Saint. You know why? Because Saint was using him at that moment. Now, even Christians sometimes can yield their vessel as an instrument that the devil uses as a tool. We don't want to do that. We want our vessels to be yielded unto God whole. We want them to be meat for the master's use. And so we don't want to be a criticizer. But we want to be a builder of the kingdom of God. When others are trying to serve God and worship God, we should be doing our best to allow them to worship God. I'm going to stop right there because actually the next verse really just builds on the rest. Anybody have anything you want to say tonight?
So it's the, it's the enemy that brings that condemnation and that there is no hope. You know, we may not like the ballast of sinners in our community or even things that we hear. There are things that are repulsive, but the bottom line is unless they quench the Spirit of God and, and they, they uh, uh, done the unpardonable sin, there's no hope for them. And who are we to rob hope? Because Christ came to die for all. Not just the good, but for everyone. Because there's no good. No, no. Someone else, yes.